Barberton, Ohio. This suburb of Akron was once known as Magic City, USA, a shining example of America's economic might, but not anymore. Barberton's kind of a, a Rust Belt city, blue collar, hardworking, kind of a town that's seen better days and trying to redefine itself in many ways, but still struggling to do so because of a poor economy. Hard times can breed cruelty and violence. The children of Summit Street were not spared. One young life here was completely shattered. In the early morning hours, six-year-old Brooke Sutton made a horrific discovery at her grandmother's house. She fled the scene and ran two doors down. I went to the neighbor's house for help. It was like my really good friends that I played with every day. And I hear banging on the door and it's kind of like you're in that dream, but you just think somebody's knocking, it's like a distance. So I got up and answered the, the door. The sight that greeted Tonya Brazil and her three daughters was truly shocking. I remember her standing there and her cheek was all swollen, bruised up, and she had blood everywhere. And just crying, saying that like she was, she got hurt. I was like, what's wrong, baby? She said, please help me. She just kept saying, please help me. And. I told her my grandma was dead and that I needed a ride to my house. Tonya had Brooke wait outside with her daughters as she collected herself. She decided it was best to drive the terrified child home to her parents. I remember it was 8 o'clock on the dot and I come down and I open the door. Brooke was really wide-eyed and she had my mom's pink silk nightgown on and it was covered in blood and she just looked really frazzled and scared and i told her grandma was dead she woke my dad up and sent him to check on her brooke's father david sutton discovered the door to judy johnson's home unlocked and in the living room he found her face down in a pool of blood. My mother loved and stabbed. My little girl spent the night here, and the neighbor just went home and said that my mother-in-law was laying on the floor dead, and I come up here and she's laying here on the floor. His frantic call summoned the police to a gruesome scene. The attack on Judy Johnson was very violent and very fierce. Lots of trauma, lots of wounds were inflicted. She had injuries to her face involving both the right side and left side of her face, including breaking the bones of her skull that are around the right eye. Investigators discovered that Judy was in fact bludgeoned, not stabbed as her son-in-law had reported. Judy Johnson sustained multiple blunt force injuries or blows to her body. Some of them are pattern injuries where the bruise is actually sort of rectangular. So maybe it's an object like baseball bats, lead pipes. The evidence began to paint an ugly picture of how the murder unfolded. The altercation with the assailant started and they moved through the room, ending up close to this living room chair. The bulk of the wounds seem to be related to this chair because that's where a lot of the blood evidence is. At some point, she had perhaps been bent over the chair and her head had been wrenched backward. Closer examination revealed there was trauma, which suggests a penetration. The defensive wounds on Judy's hands told how she'd fought back. She certainly struggled with her attacker because she has torn fingernails in her attempt to counterattack the assailant. It was a terrible fate for someone all described as a generous and caring woman. Um, Judy actually was at my house a lot. We'd come over and have coffee and we went to bingo and stuff together. She was a really good person. I love Judy. 
I just felt loved and valued because I was always around her and she did everything for me. While they continued to examine the scene, detectives interviewed the child who first discovered the body. I just remember a bunch of cops and ambulance and detectives and everybody coming and talk to me and I didn't really comprehend what was going on. Brooke told her story. We went to my cousin's birthday party and I didn't want to go home so I asked my grandma if I could stay the night. When we got home I got in my pajamas we sat down and watched TV. And after her show was over, she took me in and I went to sleep. But sometime in the night, she woke to the sound of screaming. I didn't know what was going on, so I ran out of the bedroom. A man was standing over her. I got scared and ran back to the bedroom. I'm assuming he heard me and came back to the room. I was under the covers. I was hit with something because I got knocked out. I remember waking up in the middle of the night, naked. Brooke dressed herself, then headed for the living room. You see my grandma laying on the floor, puking up blood, and I started blacking out again. She next regained consciousness at daybreak and tried to wake Judy up. I knew she was hurt, but I thought she was still alive, so I kept trying to shake her. And she wouldn't respond to me. Failing to revive her grandmother, Brooke tried desperately to get help by phone. And I called my friend from school and I left a message on her phone. I didn't even think to call the cops or anything like that. When no one answered, she ran two doors down to the home of her three best friends. She was crying like, I don't know, she just was a mess. She definitely looked like she was in pain. And we just ran to the car. She said that her, her mom lived at the bottom of the hill, so we went there. Brooke was then encouraged to provide the critical details about what she saw that night. So, I pretend to go on and ask her if she knew who hurt her grandma. Her voice message said somebody killed her grandmother, but the traumatized child had since put a face to the assailant. And I said, it looked like my Uncle Clarence. As soon as I opened the door, she grabbed me by my waist and she was like, my Uncle Clarence killed my grandma. That's all she kept saying the whole time she was there. Brooke's uncle, Clarence Elkins, was married to April's sister, Melinda. He was a 35-year-old metal press operator. Police raced towards his home 40 minutes away. If Elkins was the killer, they needed to catch him before he disappeared. Judy Johnson had been brutally raped and murdered in her home. Her six-year-old granddaughter saw it happen and was also attacked. Police moved in on the man Brooke identified as the killer, her uncle, Clarence Elkins. Deputies were telling me to stop and turn around and put my hands in the air. Clarence's wife and son looked on in disbelief. And I'm, I'm telling him, tell me what's going on. And the deputy sheriff says, Barberton Police Department got a report that my mother had been stabbed in her home. I had no clue what was going on. And they told me that my mother-in-law had been murdered and I was suspect. 
and that there was an eyewitness allegedly claiming that I was the perpetrator of this crime. I was speechless. I remember screaming as loud as I could because it hurt, physically hurt. It was a very horrifying experience. The worst day of my life, June 7th, 1998. Clarence Elkins was arrested for one of the worst crimes Barberton had ever seen. Never been in, you know, trouble with the law. I was willing to do anything to help the police. Uh, Barberton Police you know, is a typical small town police department. Murders like what happened to Judy Johnson don't come along very often. Word of the crime spread quickly through the close knit community. As Clarence was held in custody, more shocking details of the attack came to light. Medical examinations revealed six-year-old Brooke had also been sexually assaulted. I just remember that I was under the covers and I got knocked out, I was unconscious. I mean, after everything, that that's really what got me, was knowing that she had been sexually assaulted and raped. As police interviewed Judy's family and neighbors, rumors of past tension between her and Clarence surfaced. Well, Clarence and my mom did have a couple problems in the past. They had had a couple arguments. But the prime suspect denied any serious rift and offered an alibi for the night of the murder, telling detectives he was at a local bar. And I was there for a beer or two and went to another bar for, I think I drank one beer and then I come back home. He said at 2.30 in the morning, his wife Melinda was still awake. My son Brandon was not feeling well, running a fever, had a bad stomach ache. And then Clarence came home. I just said, you know, just go to bed. Yeah. I went to bed about 2.50 a.m. Investigators contend Clarence had at least a three-hour window to get up, drive 40 minutes to the crime scene, carry out the attacks, and return home before dawn. They all found Brooke's story convincing. And I said, I have to believe my daughter. She was there. And certainly, based on the girl's statements, people believe that he was guilty of what he was accused of doing. Clarence Elkins went to trial, charged with the rape and murder of Judy Johnson, along with the sexual assault and attempted murder of her granddaughter, Brooke Sutton. Clarence Elkins was viewed generally as an evil man. I mean, who would think that someone would want to brutally rape and murder their mother-in-law and beat and rape their niece? Elkins' lawyer was acutely aware of what was at stake. If you take the gruesomeness of this thing and you take all of the violence to this woman, what happened to the child, when you put all those things together under Ohio law, then you must consider the death penalty. The prosecution was able to convince the jury that Clarence had a window of opportunity for the crime and produced witnesses who claimed he had problems with Judy. I couldn't believe that they were allowed to say these types of things about me in a courtroom and went knowingly that they weren't true. There was no physical evidence linking Clarence Elkins to the scene. But when Brooke Sutton took the stand, none of that mattered. Brooke was a crime victim. There was no question about that. She was a young, baby-faced child who the whole community embraced for the horror of what she had to go through. When Brooke was on the stand, she straight looked at Clarence and said, I seen him when you punched me. Who's not going to believe her when she says that? She has no reason to lie. What she gained from it. And then you have two, a couple of psychologists coming in who identify post-traumatic stress syndrome. The, the child told them who was the perpetrator of this crime. And it just adds, adds fuel to the fire. I didn't feel that it was coming from her. I did not believe that she was saying this. It took the jury just 13 hours to decide Clarence's fate. 
he was found not guilty of aggravated murder. So when the judge read the verdict for a brief second, everybody was like, yes. And the judge said, I'm not done. I'm a charge of murder. And he started reading off for the lesser charge of murder, guilty, the rape charge, guilty, the assault on Brooke, guilty. I was numb. I couldn't yeah. say nothing because it, my son's guilty of murder? It can't be. I knew damn well that Clarence was not capable of attacking my mother. There's just no way. It was like my life was over because there's no one else to trust. There's no one else to believe. I didn't get to say goodbye to my sons or Melinda, my parents. They don't give you time with your family, your loved ones after you've been found guilty, no. And I really felt bad for Mrs. Johnson and the awful crime that was committed with her. It was terrible, but I know our son didn't do it. And from the get-go, Clarence was, I didn't do this. I had no involvement in her death. He was very adamant about his innocence. Clarence was sentenced to life in prison, branded as a child molester, the worst kind of criminal. They labeled me as a sex offender, shipped me off to a, a sex offender prison. And I'm there for something I didn't do, and I'm there for these heinous crimes. All right, what's next? What's going to happen to me here? Is this the end for me or not? But if Clarence Elkins was innocent, it meant the real killer was still stalking the streets, and the children of Barberton were not safe. Incarceration proved terrifying for the man who claimed he committed no crime. Barricading myself at nighttime, wetting everything down with water, believing someone might try to burn me alive in the middle of the night. All these things go through your mind every day. Clarence's family also suffered. They were forced to move and his young sons faced a grim future. I didn't see us surviving this. At that time, I was just, wasn't very hopeful for anything. Suicidal thoughts, for sure. Went from being just a normal child to not going out of the house, feeling guilty to have fun or laugh. Also in fear of my life and my mother's life. Amid feelings of grief, anger and mistrust, the extended family was forced to take sides. Melinda's family believed Brooke, believed the police, so they abandoned Melinda. When my uncle went to jail, I quit talking to my aunt, I quit talking to my cousins. My whole family fell apart. Clarence filed an appeal, but it was just as quickly rejected. When that happened, I just almost lost control of, and just went downhill mentally. The visits from friends and loved ones only added to his despair. Very humiliating to go to a visit. Going in there and just seeing him in that environment. You know, I always tried my best to be there whenever I could for him. But I always worried that, uh, that he would see me, you know, as if I'm not strong. And then my family or friends leaving, just not knowing that if I'll ever be able to spend a day or be there for birthdays, you know, it's all gone. That was probably the most difficult thing in my life. The case seemed closed, yet Clarence's wife and sons refused to give up without a fight. But without the police on their side, they had to become their own detectives. The family went about trying to figure out 
One, prove Clarence's innocence, and two, find out who the real perpetrator is. They took on what seemed an impossible challenge. I first began by making a suspect list, you know, because I could not imagine anybody that I knew doing this to my mom and to my niece. Given the fact that I felt that logistically that person was close in proximity, meaning Barberton. They focused on anyone in Judy Johnson's circle with a known record or anyone who may have exhibited suspicious behavior towards her. The challenge became getting his DNA. Compounding the problem is getting his DNA without him knowing about it. Melinda played a perilous game of cat and mouse with potential murderers, flirting with them in bars. If discovered collecting their DNA on the sly, there was no telling how dangerous things could have become. She was doing things that I was scared for her, you know, just going out and getting in these situations of getting hair and fingerprints and what, what have you. Months went by and many samples were surreptitiously collected. Beer bottles, cigarettes, anything suspects could leave their traces on. You know, my mom somehow, she still had the strength to keep fighting for what was right. But DNA analysis cost thousands of dollars the family didn't have. In desperation, they turned to the Ohio Innocence Project. Getting a DNA test result proving Clarence innocent is the strongest evidence you can possibly get. But before Mark Godsey could take on the family's investigation, he conducted his own. The first thing I did is looked at all the evidence and I was immediately taken by the case and thought this was an excellent prospect for the Innocence Project. There were all types of and all categories of evidence that was just never processed. You know, you had a bloody handprint on the wall, you had all these different things that could have been analyzed for DNA and fingerprints. He found blood and tissue were recovered from under Judy Johnson's fingernails, indicating she scratched her attacker. Yet when Clarence was arrested, there wasn't a mark on him. And while DNA evidence was collected from both Judy and Brooke, none of it was ever compared to Clarence's DNA. What's amazing to me looking at this case in hindsight is that you had no physical evidence connecting Clarence to the crime. You had a six-year-old girl as the witness who anybody can understand this is shaky testimony because it was dark and she's young and she's under great trauma. She may never have had an authentic recollection after having been struck so hard. Who knows whether or not she would have had the wherewithal to make accurate identifications, let alone be able to articulate them. Godsey also discovered that Brooke's account of her attacker changed between the time she ran to the neighbors and when she was questioned at home. What's important to recognize is that Brooke's very first statement was the phone message where she says, somebody killed my grandmother. And that's extremely telling. There's no mention of her uncle. Somebody, she said, if she knew it was her uncle, why say somebody? Even adult witnesses are very impressionable and can have their memories changed or they're not even aware it's changing. This is what could have happened to Brooke at the time she said her grandmother had been stabbed. It was the same account her father gave police upon discovering Judy Johnson's body. My mother loves and stabbed. My little girl spent the night here. Yet Judy was bludgeoned, not stabbed. That Brooke repeated her father's mistake should have raised concerns at the time. Three years after Clarence Elkins was incarcerated, it was time for the family torn apart by murder and suspicion to reconcile. Melinda and I didn't talk for about three years. And when I seen her, I just really wanted to hug her and because I missed her and I love her. And it's just hard, you know, because she lost her mom too. And then she lost her husband because he went to jail. And then she lost me and her niece. 
And now Brooke told her aunt that she was never really sure who her attacker was. They were asking questions about my uncle and I said it looked like him. I just went from it looked like him to, oh my God, it's Clarence. It wasn't really me saying it. It was just everybody assuming it. Police and prosecutors would tell her, well, you told us before that you were certain. So she felt sort of subtle pressures to stick with the story and to say it was certainly Clarence. She would have been sensitive to the perceived wishes and expectations of whoever she's talking to. And if they indicate that they think it was her uncle, she may incorporate that information and provide it. And now that I'm older, I know that the police could have done a better job. People shouldn't have been influencing me. I just, I just knew that he didn't do it. The effort to free Clarence intensified when Brooke publicly withdrew her testimony. Who'd you say it was? My Uncle Clarence. Okay. Why did you say it was Uncle Clarence? Because it looked like him. But do you think so today? No. Okay. It was a major breakthrough that needed support with hard evidence. We didn't have enough money to test everything from the crime scene. We had to make strategic choices. For the first time, Clarence's DNA was compared to samples collected from the crime scene and the victims. There was no match. That was huge. I mean, at that point, we knew he was innocent, and it became a matter of, okay, let's continue to build the case. We proved that it was someone else, but we didn't have a name yet. We just knew that we were getting close. We had a profile of whoever committed this crime. We moved for a new trial, and we said that based on this evidence proving Clarence innocent, a new trial should be granted, and then his conviction should be vacated, and he should be released and set free. Free Clarence now! Free Clarence now! Free Clarence now! I remember where I was. It's like when JFK was killed, I remember where I was. Uh, I was having a cup of coffee in the coffee shop. Somebody came up to me just to hear about Alcott's. But the district attorney thought Brooke had been manipulated into changing her story. The decision came down denying our motion and saying that Clarence had to spend the rest of his life in prison. We're like, what? You're, th she was overriding the fact that there was scientific evidence available to exclude Clarence uh, and taking the fact that a six-year-old child was identifying him. It's the craziest thing I ever heard in my entire life. It ultimately comes down to, I think, they don't want to admit that mistakes been made. I was beginning to think that I'm never going to get out of this. I'm never going to be able to prove my innocence. I was, I was almost to, ready to believe that there was no hope. Clarence languished in prison, consumed by the question of whose DNA was recovered from his mother-in-law's home. He had no idea just how close Judy's real killer was and how police let him slip right through their fingers. Even though his niece had recanted her testimony and DNA evidence indicated he was not the killer, Clarence Elkins remained in prison for Brooke Sutton's rape and Judy Johnson's murder. As the state refused to retry his case, his only hope was to find the real perpetrator. When we lost, it became, let's turn up the heat on trying to match this to an alternate suspect. Clarence's family never gave up trying to find the assailant, but their search went nowhere. Then four years into Clarence's sentence, everything changed. I would always check the paper and see if there was any kind of crimes that matched what happened to my mom. I picked up this newspaper article, front page news, about giving this guy seven years for child rape. The guy was Earl Mann, a violent sexual offender with a long criminal history. But that's not what startled Melinda. What caught my attention was the name of his common-law wife, who was the neighbor to my mom. The woman was Tonya Brazil. It was her house that Brooke ran to after the attack. 
Her daughters, Tasha, Misty, and Selina, were Brooke's best friends. Their father, Earl Mann, had been jailed for sexually abusing them. The first time that it happened, I was real, real little. I only remember two of the rapings. It was before I went to school, and then it was one night when my mom was at home. And then he started touching me, and that's when it escalated to the full blown out rape. If it was Earl Mann in Judy's house that terrible night, it could answer a mystery that remained from when Brooke turned up at Tonya's door. Here you have this bloody, beaten, battered child on your door. Uh, most people would say, come in immediately. I'm going to call 911. I'm going to put a blanket around you. You know, instead, Tanya slammed the door. She left me sitting on the porch for like 45 minutes. She wasn't allowed inside, so we had to stay outside. There was speculation Tanya was buying time to warn or protect her common-law boyfriend. After the murder, Tonya sent all three of her girls to live with their grandparents in another town. Something that was never fully explained at the time. Why would we have to be sent away? Why would we have to leave our family and where we were growing up in our school and if you didn't think it was him? But intrigue isn't evidence. The investigation continued. I got on this Ohio offender search, and I found out that he actually was housed in the same prison that Clarence was in. And I thought, wow. <laughs> yeah, Earl Mann was a really bad person, from what Melinda had told me. And lo and behold, he was in the same block as I was. He had committed these terrible crimes against these children. He fit the, the profile. He was a really nasty person I came to find out personally. He was sort of what they call a loner in there. People didn't want to be around him because he had done the unthinkable. Was Clarence now face to face with the cold-blooded killer and rapist of his relatives? I was trying to think of how I could get some DNA from this individual. He began the task of getting close to a dangerous psychopath. Waiting for an opportunity to steal something with his genetic markers on it. I was nervous for, for my dad's sake. You know, I didn't know what Earl Mann knew that we did. I was concerned for my dad's safety. Earl Mann started to make small talk with me. And now I started to wonder, why is this guy following me? Meanwhile, Melinda was also on the hunt for Earl Mann's DNA. I decided that I would write him fictitious letters, uh, pretending to be a pen pal, a lonely girl that, you know, likes to write to prisoners, and use scented stationery and sometimes a lipstick kiss on the bottom of the letter, which absolutely made me nauseous. But I wanted to get his attention because if he would write me back and look the envelope, then I'd have his DNA. But man didn't take the bait. The letters went unanswered. Melinda's plan failed. It was all up to Clarence. After nerve-wracking months spent tracking his nemesis, Clarence's chance finally came. This one day in the summer of 2005, I was seeing Earl Mann putting a cigarette butt down on a makeshift ashtray. I got some clean tissue paper and, and picked the, the cigarette butt out of the makeshift ashtray. Clarence sent the evidence to his lawyer for DNA testing. If he got the result he wanted, he could be a free man. If not, he would remain behind bars for the rest of his life. As he waited and hoped, 
he learned firsthand just how violent Earl Mann was. We're sitting at a little table. Man struck another inmate with a lock and a sock right in front of me. I couldn't believe what I seen. And if man found out what Clarence had done, there was no doubt a worse fate awaited him. It could have been me. Six years had passed since Clarence Elkins was convicted of rape and murder. Through stealth and courage, he may have found a way to convict a fellow prisoner he believed was the real killer. And he was able to pick up a cigarette butt on the sly, mail it to the lab. And I know of no other case where the wrongfully convicted person himself is the one that participated as his own detective. With bated breath, Clarence, his friends and loved ones awaited the results. After what seemed like an eternity, news came. And it came back and Earl Mann's DNA matched the DNA from the crime scene. It's probably one of the happiest days of my life. <laughs> A skeptical DA's office carried out its own tests on the DNA and came to the same conclusion. There was no doubt Earl Mann committed these terrible crimes. The Summit County prosecutors began interrogating him and polygraphing him. Mann adamantly denied any involvement. Did you take any part in killing Judith Johnson? No. I, I, I want to pass this test because I didn't do this. You know what I'm saying? And it's hard for me to have to sit here and admit that. The evidence against Mann was irrefutable. Incredibly, the state of Ohio still refused to declare Clarence Elkins innocent. But the Attorney General himself intervened. That they will be petitioning for the immediate release of Clarence Elkins and a dismissal of all charges. The whole concept of the justice system is to seek justice. And I think this is one instance where it has really worked. Seven years late, but it has worked to ultimately <clears throat> arrive at a just conclusion. Ultimately, on December 15th, we learned that they were willing to drop the charges against Clarence. I didn't think it was real like the day I got arrested. I was kind of numb. Just not computing what was happening. Clarence Elkins finally walked free after almost seven and a half years. There to greet him was the young girl whose words sent him to prison in the first place. I was afraid that he was going to hate me, but he walked out of the prison doors and I was one of the first ones he gave a hug. She was the, the daughter I, that I didn't have. She was just a, a, a sweetheart of a child and... and I've never had any resentment towards her. I'm very proud of everyone who stepped forward on my behalf for justice. Freedom! Together again! Two and a half years after Clarence's exoneration, Earl Mann faced justice for the grandmother he murdered and the child he raped. Earl Mann stood up in court and admitted what he did. Guilty. To stand in the courtroom and see Earl Mann plead guilty was very satisfying. I think it was an opportunity for Melinda and for Clarence to finally have their moment, you know, have their closure, if you want to use that word. I think you are such a coward. I was only six years old. What could I have done to you? What could my grandma have done to you? And I think it was finally at that point where it was total vindication for the Elkins family. I've waited 10 years. Little did you know what I was doing. You weren't very clever at all. He got what he had coming. In a stunning twist, the Elkins family discovered that shortly after the murder, the police had arrested man for yet another crime. He was picked up on a burglary and he made a statement to the police that he uh, thought he was being arrested for the murder of Judith Johnson. At the time, the arresting officer noted Mann's tacit confession, but it's unclear why it was disregarded. 
I think in that exemplifies the blinders that the department put on. They had their man, they had their suspect, they had their eyewitness, and they went with it, regardless of anything else that might have been out on the fringe. Man's guilty plea meant there was no official account of what happened that night. But in a letter, he claimed he was on the run from a halfway house and that his initial motive was robbery. I knocked on the door once, and Mrs. Johnson answered my knock fairly quickly. We went straight into her kitchen and sat down at the table. It was there in the kitchen where the attack began and came to an end in the living room. At the time, I had no idea that Brooke was there for the night in the next room. He wrote that after the crime, he hid at her friend's, then went to see Tonya Brazil after Brooke had been driven home. She immediately accused him. I don't think the door was locked. He kind of just came in. And my mom was like, what did you do? The first thing Tanya said was that Judy was killed last night. And I tried to act stunned or shocked at the news she gave me. Tanya further stated, we thought you did it. I turned to her and looked with anger and said, what? If Tanya believed Earl Mann was guilty, it could explain claims that she influenced Brooke identifying the killer as Uncle Clarence rather than somebody. The astonishing coincidence that the first adult to whom Brooke has an extended conversation is the partner of the actual culprit. I think my mom kind of forced it in her head. And she said, well, do you know who killed your grandma? And I said, it looked like my Uncle Clarence. The blood and the mayhem and the distress that she can see on the basis of Brooke's appearance, if she connects that, even with the possibility that her partner may have been responsible for it, even unconsciously, she might try to deflect Brooke or to propose an an alternative culprit. My mom's like, oh yes, yes it was him, it was him. Like kind of like putting that in her mind that it was her uncle. And then I got to my mom's and it was, oh Clarence killed Judy. Tonya strongly disagrees and insists she was there to help. Well I don't care what they say, I know that I'm telling the truth, so I don't care what anybody thinks. Brooks came to my door, she said, please help me. My grandma's dead, my uncle Clarence killed my grandma, my uncle Clarence killed my grandma. I don't have no reason to lie about it. Tonya also denies any suggestion from her children, Brooke and the others, that she left Brooke outside for 45 minutes, or that she was in any way covering for Earl Mann at the time. I was not protecting Earl. Earl was not in my house. Oh, I have nothing to hide. I have not been with that man in years. God was there with me and God knows that I did right. Earl Mann is currently serving a term of 55 years to life for his crimes. I have a lot of hatred toward him. That's one thing I've been struggling with. Like he's my father, but I still hate him. I don't have memory of him. I'd choose not to. I just feel like if someone would have came to us first, Stuff would have been different with the Elkins case. In several lawsuits, Clarence Elkins received over $4 million as compensation for his wrongful conviction. But the long ordeal took a toll on his family. His marriage to Melinda did not survive. They were both so adamant on fixing the problem at hand that they kind of grew apart, you know, as far as their marriage went. Both have since remarried. Molly Elkins is helping Clarence move forward with his life. Sad. So sad for him. He didn't deserve it, you know, and he's he's just such a special person. I mean, he's the, one of the kindest people and most genuine people I've ever met in my life. And it's just so sad that that happens to somebody. Inevitably, the wounds are hard to heal, and dark memories remain. And there was many sleepless nights, many tears. Yes. I don't want to dwell on it. I don't want to think about it. I want to move on. 
experiencing being wrongfully incarcerated, you know, seven and a half years. One day is too long to be wrongfully incarcerated. In next week's brand new I Didn't Do It.